There is a monsoon break period, but there are strong winds along with some light clouds, uh, parts, partly sunny, uh, and we're in the last chapter. So I'm going to start with a bit of a background on uh, when the human impacts may have uh, started to be obvious already. Mostly we think about post-industrial revolution, fossil fuel burning, greenhouse gas emissions, mainly CO2, and then agricultural changes, methane, N2O, land use changes, uh, etc. But Bill Ruddiman is one guy who has been at it for a while to argue that uh, human impact was fairly obvious in greenhouse gases already through the Holocene. So we'll spend one podcast looking at that and then come back and look at uh, how the Anthropocene acceleration as uh, proposed by Will Steffen and uh, gang uh, works. So just to orient ourselves again, looking at carbon dioxide levels in parts per million going back to the last uh, eight glacial cycles. We already talked about how deglaciation is abrupt, uh, jump in carbon dioxide is order 100 ppm, and then the cooling phase is slower because atmosphere dries up as glaciers build and snowfall rates slow down, but both are positive feedback. This is a positive ice albedo feedback in the warming phase, and this is a positive ice albedo feedback uh, in the cooling phase, and you can see this uh, remarkable asymmetry, abrupt warming, slow cooling, abrupt warming, slow coolings, and so on. And then we came out of the uh, last uh, ice age, as we said already several times in the last chapter, about 10,000 years ago, past the bowling alley rod, older dryas, younger dryas, and so on. And we started ramping up the uh, fossil fuel. Uh, burning and greenhouse gases mostly since the Industrial Revolution and you can see that the post-1950 level have been levels have shot through the roof we are over 420 ppm uh, now which is higher than anything we have seen for at least a million years uh, but we know that during the Cretaceous when dinosaurs were roaming around it was about a thousand ppm so we are still lower than that but of course again the uh, question is why should it matter because we were not around when dinosaurs were running around so it's mostly a question of what happens to us so going through Bill Rediman's nice review article in uh, geophysical reviews or some such thing reviews of geophysics uh, we can look at a few figures he's looking here at uh, 20,000 years so end of the last glacial maximum so glacial cold period to interglacial warmth and his idea is to look at all these previous glacial interglacial cycles and rates of change of CO2 and methane and try to see how things have uh, worked in the Holocene. If we were coming out of the glacial uh, into the interglacial warmth then uh, at some point we were uh, uh, looking at the orbital forcing where we headed into the next uh, glacial period if so what were the the rates of glaci glacial interglacial uh, greenhouse gases and uh, temperatures etc and he does a, a thorough comparison as we will see to s argue that the rates of increase uh, in the greenhouse gases have definitely been unusual compared to the previous uh, glacial interglacial cycles which can be considered as natural variability whereas we had agriculture during that time so he infers a anthropogenic greenhouse effect uh, because uh, the observed trend is much higher than what we would have uh, if there was no anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions based on uh, previous uh, glacial deglacial cycles. So this is just a schematic summary of two views of the Holocene climate. Climate natural hypothesis regard the nearly stable observed climate trend as natural in origin, but the anthropogenic hypothesis claims that the climate would have naturally cooled and passed the threshold for early glacial inception if anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions had not offset most of the natural uh, cooling. Okay, so let's just run through a few figures. Here we are looking at uh, 
Holocene again uh, for equivalent in previous interglacials uh, and how methane has changed in the Holocene. So taking all the rates uh, of the previous uh, glacial cycles um, and this is for CO2. This is the measured temperatures in deuterium and delta O18. So that gives you a sense uh, that we are not only uh, abnormal in the methane and CO2 but also in the uh, records of temperature as measured by paleo proxies. Comparison of Holocene trends in red uh, to stacked averages so it's basically taking all the glacials and interglacials and stacking them together. The light blue shading shows one standard deviation of the previous interglacials. Uh, methane CO2 deuteri delta deuterium delta O18 from sources listed in figure 2 caption which I didn't show here. Dome uh, C CO2 and methane data for the pre-Holocene interglaciations calculated by binning at uh, thousand year intervals, dome C. So there are some technical details here uh, which I can skip. Um, and uh, anything else I should add here. So let's leave this here and look at how the spread of agricultural crops happened during the Holocene. Domesticated crops originated during the early Holocene from 12,000 to 8200 years ago in and in the middle of the Holocene from 8200 to 4200 years ago. We talked about the pre-10,000 year period where we had uh, Evidences of uh, attempted agriculture or at least a mixed hunter-gatherer uh, wild crop uh, cereal uh, consumption type behavior versus uh, successful agriculture during the Holocene. Uh, so combining all those uh, numbers along dispersion pathways represent ages in thousands of years. So you can go back to the Levant region and some uh, South American regions where uh, you see the older dates in the yellow. So these you can think of it as the uh, early Holocene and this is the middle uh, Holocene. So already in early Holocene we have lots of uh, agricultural uh, crops being uh, uh, spreading uh, especially uh, from here out of Levant into these regions uh, and from east uh, in uh, Asia, Indian region and North and South America as well as Mesoamerica as we called it before and the Middle Holocene uh, diffusion pathways uh, the, the size of the uh, brackets here indicate the time in age in thousands of years so uh, we know that uh, civilizations appeared and disappeared and various civilizational uh, cultural changes were noticed, noted in archaeological evidences and so on that we already discussed in the previous chapters so this gives you a sense that throughout the uh, Holocene even before the end of uh, the uh, Younger Dryas there have been extensive agricultural activities across the globe all the way into uh, New Guinea here. Uh, more uh, uh, Relevantly for methane, for example, estimated irrigated rice contribution to atmospheric methane during the late Holocene. This is the spread of rice farming from across southern and southeastern Asia. Again, looking at uh, sites that have been dated that we have uh, talked about in various ways, uh, going all the way into Southeast Asia here. And these are estimated areas of irrigated rice farming in Asia and contribution to atmospheric methane concentrations uh, compared to C methane concentrations at Dome C. So the idea is to look at uh, the uh, changes over the periods and estimated uh, irrigated and lowland rice contributions accounting for most of the methane uh, here. This is percentage of modern value and these are uh, areas of rice uh, in thousands of square kilometers and these are values recorded in a Dome C ice cores in parts per billion of methane itself. Again, very uh, stubborn arguments uh, that 
human beings have had a significant impact on CO2 and methane through the Holocene, through agricultural activities, and we'll look at deforestation in a minute, minute as well. And of course, you cannot ignore livestock. So the first appearance of livestock in Asia and Africa, going back to again 10,000 to 7,000 years, 7,000 to 5,000, 5 to 3, 3 to 1,000 years in these color uh, codes. So you can see oldest of the cattle cult that we talked about, the cattle uh, cultures uh, uh, were discovered here and then later on in large parts of Asia and India uh, and across Africa which would have depended on uh, the greening of Africa and so on and way down into South Africa, Southern India and Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia and North uh, East Asia during the more recent 3000 to 1000 year period where lots of cultural changes, civilizations, militarizations, adventures, uh, historical records have already been uh, noted in our previous discussions. Looking a bit at the, the forest clearance, this is evidence of early forest clearance and settlement. Uh, a locations of cores in European pollen database. Cores used for pollen summary uh, are shown in 9b here. Okay, so this is a pollen biome sums forests semi open and open with total number of sites varying, of course, over time as you go to older days, uh, older periods, you have fewer sites, and as you come to the first millennium, uh, you get a lot more sites and then uh, they have dropped out, dropped off again. Okay, and here uh, looking at um, changes in vegetation, pseudo biome sums. Uh, for forest open, semi-open and mixed forest and open vegetation. C and D are mid-Holocene increases in number of archaeological sites in north central China. Okay, so this is 8,000 to 7,000 years ago. Fewer sites as uh, same as here, but many more sites over the more recent 5,000 to 4,000 uh, years ago. This is how you have to deal with data anyways. Uh, they also go through some uh, calculations on mass balance, so two mass balance estimates of carbon transfers among major reservoirs during the last 7,000 years. Uh, one is based on assumption of small peak burial, so you have to make some assumptions about climate and organic carbon burial in peatlands, and B is based on larger peat burial, so there is some sensitivity uh, involved in these two assumptions, which obviously I'm not going to go into, but just wanted to point out that carbon transfer since 7,000 years uh, ago to uh, year 1850 in billions of tons buried. Uh, this is a small peat burial assumption here, so uh, the contributions uh, uh, peat takes up and delta C, uh, delta 13 CO2 trend uh, indicating nest net terrestrial emissions during this period from 7000 to 1850. Other natural processes such as monsoons and CO2 fertilization, uh, so monsoons would uh, create a lot of uh, um, vegetation uh, burials uh, as well as uh, weathering rates over the Himalayas and the rivers, but you also have uh, other processes which uh, create CO2 emissions. So this is total billions of tons emitted attributable to men monsoons and CO2 fertilization effects. Um, this is the anthropogenic estimate of 3.5 ppm CO2. Uh, we have uh, looked at between 7000 and 1850. So just remember the period, okay? This is the alternative uh, interpretation of large peat burial where the, bury, the amount buried in peat goes up tremendously here, um, but we still have contributions from Delta C, uh, Delta C13 CO2 trend uh, in nest, net terrestrial emissions and other natural processes. But here the anthropogenic emission uh, estimate goes to 23 ppm of CO2 as opposed to 3.5 ppm here in small burial. So obviously these are assumptions and you are trying to constrain in some inverse modeling sort of way to see how human if, uh, impacts and agriculture especially and cattle and forest clearing have affected uh, greenhouse gas emissions through the Holocene. 
essentially an argument that global warming and increasing greenhouse gases happened through the Holocene, but much more drastic claim is that the stability of the Holocene that we have used as a uh, a basic driving mechanism for successful agriculture and evolution of modern human to be related to human activities themselves that increasing greenhouse gases along the way themselves have been responsible for keeping the uh, Holocene warm and stable as opposed to the cooling that should have happened based on the uh, interglacial and the uh, orbital forcings along the way okay whether you believe it or not this is an interesting idea that has a lot of uh, evidences pulled together to make this case so take it for what it is okay